And I will lightly start getting us started with remarks and opening. Um, so good evening again, everyone. Graciela Guzman, I'm an organizer at the Chicago Teachers Union. My pronouns are she, hers, ella. Um, and what a, a timely time for this conversation. Um, I think a lot of you know the history of our sanctuary series as really taking really notable pieces of the broader sanctuary movement and based on the timeliness, really dissecting those for broader conversation, uh, mostly with our union family, but at times with external folks. Um, and it really seemed like a great time to marry a lot of the conflicting events around our universe that a lot of us are discussing, not just in the classroom, but um, at our tables, in our homes um, with a lot of each other to really intersect them to help us understand one, where there's conversations that are emergent in our classrooms, what is the role that we have as a labor family and leaning into those conversations and their complications to not just find a path forward um, for our students and for our union, um, but also to really understand what is the power um, that the union should flex and civil responsibility. So really grateful to be leveraging three pieces that we've heard widely not just in the news, but in conversation about what's coming up in the classrooms and for you all. So one piece being this broader conversation around newcomers, newcomer students, broadly like everything that's emerging around us and in our city. Um, that's been an evolving piece that we've been discussing for the larger part of um, the migrant the migration um, episode here in Chicago for over the last year, um, but really continuing to explore and analyze what is happening around us. So that's one piece of this conversation, but something that we're really proud of is to be able to think about what is happening in the newcomer community um, in direct parallel with experiences that we need to center for Black lives and experiences. Most notably, what can we do to really build solidarity with Black lives and think about Black student experience? Um, so that's a piece that we'll be touching on as well. And then the, the third piece of this conversation is um, given um, the HOD, the House of Delegates vote that we all took um, to really build solidarity around the call um, in our labor movement for ceasefire, how is it that we as a union weigh in on, on that conversation given um, the human suffering that is happening globally? Um, so happy to kick it over to Jackson Potter for a broader introduction before I introduce our panelists. So Jackson. Thanks, Graciela. Um, really incredibly honored, excited to have this amazing panel. I'm the vice president of Chicago Teachers Union. I was just seeing uh, our older woman, freedom fighter, Jesse Fuentes from the 26th Ward last night. And I told her we got Juan Gonzalez, you know, helping us talk through these very important issues that are causing crisis in the world, but also in our city. And she was just thrilled, like, oh man, you got Juan. He's the OG of our movements. Um, you know, really just been an incredible shining light of truth telling um, through Democracy Now! And, you know, with some of our member leaders who have been leading this important work, in, both in terms of doing sanctuary in their own school communities, in terms of fighting oppression in Israel, occupied territories, and how that also impacts our school communities, fighting anti-Semitism, Islamophobia. Um, all of these things are interconnected. And I think, you know, as a union, we've led the way on social justice issues for many years. Uh, we, you know, we were one of the first unions to take on ceasefire as a demand. And now we can hear that call resonating worldwide. Uh, you know, we were one of the first unions demanding sanctuary city status in um, our ordinances, but also in our contracts. So I think this is an opportunity for us to see the links uh, and how all of this connects. We're recording this. So Juan, I know we're a small and mighty attendance tonight, but um, you should be encouraged to know that we will be sharing this with our members. It's part of a resolution we passed to do these teach-ins at regular intervals. So we're raising awareness, popular education, and our ability to fight for the oppressed in all the places where we teach, where we work, where we live. So thank you all for being here. I'm gonna sign off and come back on as a participant so I can listen to all the wisdom tonight.
Thank you, Jackson. Um, and before I kick it off, you know, I think um, to broadly introduce our panel, um, you've heard Jackson talk about the illustrated work and history um, that Mr. Juan Gonzalez has done, um, who's uh, presently um, at the Great Cities Institute, um, but has really held a really important place in how we have conversations through his role in journalism um, broadly in many institutions, but including Democracy Now! So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we're really happy to be able to anchor this conversation with, as Jackson mentioned, um, various teacher leaders from our uh, labor movement here at CTU. So really proud to be joined by both uh, Rami and Tomas and Silvelia. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, Erin, who will be hopping on, um, hopefully at some point in this conversation. Um, so stay tuned as she hops on. Um, but with that, I get to turn on my best um, Oprah anchor voice, and I'm really excited about it. So here we go. Um, Mr. Gonzalez, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had to um, do a, a similar teach-in with our staff here at CTU that really was formational and instructional and in thinking about how do we really think about migration, U.S. role, U.S. Uh, sanctions, interventions, really thinking about like how far in the scope of history do we need to understand um, what has happened to understand where we're going and more importantly what is our role um, in thinking about advocacy in the future um so we'd be love to kind of like uh have you uh kind of give us your take um what is the u.s role and what is presently happening in migration um and more importantly for for some folks that might be getting to understand what your report most recently found um what are some um, most telling uh, pieces of information that you would say in terms of the response presently in our city in comparison with other populations, including um, UK Ukrainian refugees. And I'm so sorry, Mr. Gonzalez, I have you on mute at the moment. No, I was on mute. Okay, I'm fine now. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks again for in inviting me back. And I, I just, I'm going to try to just quick, briefly uh, touch on some of the questions that you asked. One, I think the key thing to understand that I've been trying now for better part of 30 years uh, to explain to people is that uh, the migration crises uh, that we, the crisis that we currently con um, confront is only the latest, uh, the latest uh, form of an ongoing crisis that affects not just the United States, but all the industrial countries uh, of the world. It, you know, it's the same problem, the same situation is occurring in France, in Germany, uh, in Britain, in the Netherlands, uh, all the old colonial powers of the 19th century that carved up Asia, Africa, and Latin America and stole all the resources from those countries or extracted the resources for those countries never expected that the people of those countries, of their, of their former colonies, would eventually find their way to the metropolis. Uh, and in fact, it was the wars, especially World War II, where so many Colonial peoples were drafted into the wars that established the routes of communication and transportation and connections that led after World War II to this massive surge of Algerians, Tunisians, and Moroccans to France, Pakistanis, Indians, and Jamaicans to England, Latin Americans to the United States, Indonesians uh, to the Netherlands. They went precisely to their former, to the metropolis of their former colonial masters. And so each, each country is now facing the enormous change. That's the long-term historical uh, issue that we're dealing with. This is, as I said in, in one of my books, the harvest of empire. You created empires in the past and never expected those empires to come back and bite you. And that's what exactly what's happening now. Uh, that's the long-term. The short-term thing, what's happened in the last couple of years is that there's a whole new populations that are coming to the United States. Which, you know, We are obviously here in Chicago, New York, and these other places for the first time seeing large numbers of Venezuelans, Nicaraguans, and especially Cubans. Of, uh, in the last two years, more Cubans have come to the United States than at any time in U.S. history, more than after the 1959 Cuban Revolution, more than during the Bacero Crisis of 1994, the Mariel boat lift of 1980. This is the biggest surge of Cubans in U.S. history just in the last two years. Same thing for Venezuelans and the same thing for Nicaraguans. Uh, why is that? These are the three countries that the United States is currently at war with, <laughs> waging economic war uh, and uh, with uh, embargoes and blockades. So the, the impact 
that our government is having on the economies of this country is forcing so many of these people to leave. Uh, and uh, and therefore, suddenly Americans are finding them. And now we're seeing all of this battle in Chicago and in New York City and in, and in Philadelphia and in Denver and up in Massachusetts, where longtime residents, not only not only white folks, but African-Americans and Latinos. There are a lot of Latinos that are angry saying, "How? why are you diverting local resources for these folks when we have all these needs that you haven't met? So it's creating enormous divisions. And I think that unless people understand why this is happening and how it's happening or what can be done about it, we're going to continue to have uh, more division. Uh, and so it's part of, part of it is explaining the history. Uh, two is explaining how U.S. policy directly changes things. If the United States stopped its embargo of Cuba, uh, its economic war against Venezuela and its war against Nicaragua, the migrations from those countries would drop dramatically. Uh, and uh, But it doesn't want to do that. So that's why pressure has to be exercised on our government to do that. I, I just testified at a congressional briefing yesterday morning in, in Washington, D.C., where the, a lot of the progressive members of Congress uh, are trying to get a new Latin America policy because, uh, you know, this is the anniversary, the 200th anniversary this month of the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, uh, that uh, So they're trying to get a new policy for Latin America uh, f uh, out of Congress and out of the White House. Uh, so I think it's it's important to understand this is the root cause of the problem. As far as the Ukraine is, one of the things I've said repeatedly, 29,000 Ukrainians have come to the Chicago area in the last two years. Uh uh, that's more than the total number of migrants that have come in from uh, Venezuela and the southwest border. I, th I think we're at 24, 25,000 now among the, the migrants uh, uh, from the southwest border. More Ukrainians have come than, um, uh, than all the other people in the southwest border. There's no Ukrainians sleeping in police precincts. There's none in shelters. Uh, uh, there's, there's no outcry about why have all these people suddenly come. Why? Because the federal government allocated $670 million in its war money for Ukraine to resettle those Ukrainians who came here. They all get immediate uh, work permits. They all get Medicaid, SNAP benefits, SSI, uh, uh, job counseling. All that stuff is provided by the federal government, and there's no uproar. And in, and, uh, in fact, Chicago's public schools alone have seen an increase of 4,300 children in one year whose primary language is Russian or Ukrainian, right? 4,300 kids uh, in, the, in the Chicago public schools. You go out to the Northwest and all the other, uh, all the other suburban towns, they've all had huge increases in Russian-speaking and Ukrainian-speaking children. No one is raising an uproar about it. No one is saying we can't handle it. Why? Because the federal government took care of it. And I think that the same thing what I'm hearing from New York, for instance, I talked to a congressman in New York who told me that the principals in the public schools of New York are ecstatic about the 25,000 new children that have come into the public school system in New York in the last uh, year. Why? Because every child that comes into the school brings Title I money, brings limited English proficient money, brings school lunch money, and all of these schools that we're seeing their enrollments decline are suddenly beginning to see their enrollments go back up and they're getting more. So they're not having to close as many schools. I think the same is true of Chicago. The input of all these children into the Chicago public schools is good for the public school system uh, and uh, because it will bring resources. But it's being the narrative that's created is that it's a burden, that it's a, a problem rather than it's an opportunity. Uh, or it's a way to uh, revive school systems that were declining in enrollment. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Juan Gonzalez. And I think just to kick it over, you know, Tomas, Rami, Aaron, Silvia, in different ways, you're all experiencing um, the student experience, the family experience. I know many of you have brought scenarios of, um, for example, missing bus cards for our STLF population, uh, not having tables and chairs, trying to find winter clothes for our students. Um, and, and we learned kind of in our leadership training earlier this month that there were schools that knew that newcomers were coming, but still hadn't gotten them yet. So hadn't quite had the opportunity to experience this just yet. So just curious from your vantage points, like what does this look like in your classrooms and your schools on the ground? Anything you'd lift up? And maybe I'll kick it over to get us started to Tomas. 
Hello, thank you, Graciela, for the question. Um, <clears throat> I'm a member of the Early Childhood Committee and the Bilingual Committee here at CTU. Um, and through my work on these committees and with conversations with my friends and personal experiences at my school, um, and also from attending a couple community meetings at different wards here in the city of Chicago, I've been able to hear about the experiences with newcomer students and how it's impacting our schools, how it's impacting our classrooms, and honestly, the resources that we really need right now. Um, I think it's important to understand, because I do hear this from some folks, that this is a migration issue, this is a political issue, how does this impact us? But I think one thing that folks are noticing in schools is that this is an educational issue because the more newcomers are joining our classrooms, the clearer the picture is becoming to us that we do not have the resources that we need to adequately provide newcomers uh, and meet their needs. Newcomers are coming to our, to our city with their families, and, and this includes children. These children are coming into our classrooms, into our schools, and we're welcoming them. And teachers across the city are doing the best to welcome students, but there are obstacles. And what we need is our district to help us overcome those obstacles and remove barriers so that we could provide our students with the resources that they need. I would like to talk a little bit <clears throat> or center this a little bit around the obstacles that we've had to overcome. I, in our last contract in 2019, we were able to make significant gains in terms of bilingual education. But I think we need to realize that public education in general has been underfunded really for decades and particularly in the area of bilingual education, when we're talking about curriculum, uh, staffing, and other resources. Um, and like thinking of conversations that I've had with teachers at my school and teachers at other schools, what we're experiencing right now is an increase in classroom size because more students are coming into our classroom. Teachers asking for desks because there are not enough desks in the classroom and we have to go into like the warehouse and get more desks. Language barriers, that is, that's a major key point right there. Um, a lack of high curriculum in Spanish, and I'm not, I'm talking about adequate high quality curriculum created in Spanish, not direct translations of Skyline. Um, teacher burnout, teacher turnover. Um, we need to also address the shortage of teachers and, and work on teacher retainment. Um, other issues that teachers are facing. Um, Centered really around the shortage of bilingual staff. And when I'm talking about staff, I don't simply mean teachers, I mean paraprofessionals, social workers, counselors, especially when we're talking about students that have left their country, left family members behind. I was able to work with a family where the father is here in the United States with his children, but mom was left back home. That is very traumatic for our families. And we need to be able to provide them with counseling and services and social work services in their native language. Um, I think it's also important to highlight that in some areas of the city, teachers have been facing these challenges that predate the current arrival of newcomers. We have teachers that in their building, their buildings, their student body represent over 30 languages, teachers whose classrooms represent four or five, six different languages that the teachers are not fluent in. Um, and that makes it very difficult to meet the needs of their students. I know uh, Mr. Gonzalez mentioned about Russian. That's one language that's, as, as far as I knew, I think last year, we didn't have any Russian teachers, I think, working for the district. I'm not sure if that has changed, but definitely there is a high demand for teachers that speak Russian, and it makes it very difficult for teachers and other staff members, other staff personnel at our schools um, to work with children when we can't even communicate with them, teachers should not have to resort to Google Translate, to translate worksheets, to communicate with students. We should be able to have adequate staffing at our school um, to meet the needs of our students and the needs of their families as well. Um, and it's, it's difficult when we're placing students in these classrooms. And it's not the teacher's fault that they're not necessarily fluent in the various languages in their classroom, or they may not be necessarily trained or certified as bilingual teachers or ESL teachers. And this is why we really need the district to step up. I think we have been in the in need of these things for many years, many decades, but now I think it really demonstrates and highlights how dire the situation is. And with our contract expiring at the end of the school year, I think this is the perfect opportunity for us to advocate for our students and our families and our communities 
um, and as I mentioned before, more bilingual staff, we really need teachers, paraprofessionals, interpreters, even if we could just get interpreters in some of our classrooms, that really would make a difference uh, in working with our students. Um, again, the bilingual curriculum, that's really important. I know teachers at my school are using Skyline. Um, and one of the teachers, I heard them, she was talking to me and she was talking to the other uh, teacher and she was telling us how the monolingual classrooms are on unit two. And she's like, I'm kind of falling behind, but it doesn't really even matter because even if, if I were going on to unit three, unit three hasn't been released in Spanish yet. So what use would it be even if I were on track? Um, and not to focus just on Spanish, we need bilingual curriculum in other languages as well. And we need teachers that speak, um, that are bilingual in those other languages as well. Um, when we're talking about teacher retainment and recruitment, it's not enough to just post an ad right, for a position, we need to be actively maybe forming partnerships with universities, providing um, tuition reduction for teachers, real incentives for teachers to go into these fields, or even students that are still in college to go into these fields, um, because the teachers are not just going to suddenly emerge. We really need to, like, cultivate maybe our own educators within our buildings um, to pursue ESL endorsements. I know many teachers would like to learn Spanish. That's something that we should provide. If you want to learn a language, we should be able to help you with that so that you can communicate with, with your students. Because we have teachers that want to communicate with their students and they're trying their best. It's just very challenging with all the other demands already on our plate. Um, and we're talking about other resources. I know you have mentioned codes. We need codes. Our students need food, access to Medicare, housing. That's a very important one. If a child doesn't have a safe place to come home to, how do we expect them to be productive at school and engage in our learning when they don't even have a place, a steady place to call home? Um, and I think with our contract expiring and us preparing through our committee work, this is really the opportunity we have to seize to really uh, fight for the change and the, the pursue the contract demands that we need that we know will help our students and help us within our classrooms as well. Thank you, Tomas. That's really well said. And to keep in the thread of, you know, pre-existing issues that are kind of amplified by what we're experiencing right now in the classroom, I want to kick it over to Silvelia, thinking about the context, right, of predominantly uh, historical Black institutions of learning within our CPS family. And as they kind of confront um, the incorporation of newcomers, I think it's been really strongly said by the union how much we want to transform and rebuild a system that not only just works for our newcomers, but that also addresses like all of the underlying needs that we've been fighting for as a union before this crisis. So thinking about that, what is that? What are you hearing? What are experiences? What what do we need to be centering as we think about a broader movement that not only um, supports solidarity because of what is going on, but how do we transform systems to make sure that they center Black lives and also other Chicagoans? Um, well, you know, it's still because we went from being 7% black to now we, uh, I mean, 7% Latin, Latin, Latino. And this year we are over 20%. We're like 21% Latino. And we are still in the first semester of the school year. Um, and usually they, we see another influx of students that come in between January and March. We receive more students to come in. So we don't even know what that looks like. And um, right now we are faced with the fact of trying to find an ELPT person and with having 60 um, Latin Latinx students in the building um, is difficult with the language barrier. And then the language barrier is even broader because everybody isn't coming from the same place. We have Venezuela, we have Mexico. So they're not coming from just one place. They're not coming from one country. They're coming from different countries and they have different dialects. So even with trying to meet the needs of the students and the parents to have a conversation with the parents, it's even hard. It's even hard for our staff that even speak Spanish to even understand 
because of the different dialects that go on because some people speak their the like the dialect is different um but also being in the Austin community where our students um is a high poverty rate already for the black community now we have an influx of immigrants coming in our migrants are coming in and that's making it even harder especially when you have we have many students that are in the lower grades being impacted in our pre-k to third grade especially so the lang language barrier is even greater because they don't they don't know how to read their native language as well as english so that's even harder and now you they're in the classroom um with students so we do a lot of things to make sure we try to make sure that we don't have the stereotypes between the black and brown we try to make sure that we have a lot of do a lot of different activities to make our uh brown families feel welcome and make sure that everybody is included when we do a lot of our activities now um, because we don't want anybody. First of all, we don't want the division because we do know that we have people out here that want to divide the black and the brown because they already know that if we are to, if our races are to come together and really understand that they are already the minority and they don't want us to understand that we together already make them the minority. Um, so we do a lot of different things to really make sure um, that our families are feel welcome. Um, we've partnershiped with uh, different organizations to make sure that our students have coats, to make sure that our babies have um, shoes and everything. We try to make sure that, and that's not just for our newcomers either. That's for any family that is in our school because we already know that our students and see, we're also in the community where this summer, many of our, we have students that were hit from the flood. So that's another issue that we faced. So then we had other things, other situations. So we've had a lot of different obstacles to come up to actually help, I mean, try to help our families this year. Um, and being in the union, we have to be the voice for our, our students and our families that don't know how to have their voices heard. We are that for the people um, because it's very important that they feel like they have some type of hope. Because when you're already feeling down and you already feel like everybody is against you and then people don't want you here, you need somebody that's going to uplift you, somebody that's going to give you some type of hope and to tell you it's going to get better it well, you can make it and those are the things that we try to really um do when we're at school and we try to make sure that our students feel like they are part of a family um we try to make sure that our students understand and we communicate as much as we can with them but at but as we say the language barrier is a huge problem um because I want to be able to have a conversation with my um, Latino students of how they're feeling. I want to be able to have a conversation to even know what their traumas are, what happened to them on their as they were coming here. I think that's important for them to be able to share their story and for their classmates to be able to understand what they went through in order to get here and to understand. And I believe that would help the black and brown community to understand if they were to hear 
what these families have gone through in order to get to America and the reasons why they came to America, we wouldn't be so focused on what else is going on. Um, like Mr. Gonzalez said, we want to focus on what they're giving the newcomers, but nobody's saying what they've given the Ukrainians. And that's that's huge, but that's by de that's by design. That's to that's a distraction. That's to make us angry. And we should not be angry because we can continue to help each other because now that enrollment is helping our, is building our school, is helping our school. And then with um, the bill that was, when we know now that monies will not be going to the charter schools, uh, to the private schools anymore, um, that means we'll be getting some students back even more. So that means that we'll be getting more money, more money will be coming in and hopefully we'll be receiving more resources to help our students because that is what is needed, the resources, because the SEL, the, the trauma, if we can help our students that have been, that with the trauma, I believe we will see greater academic growth, but we have to address what our babies have gone through and help them to heal and not just our students we have to help our parents as well and we can't forget about the people that stand in front of our babies every day too we need to help our teachers because our teachers go through things just as well we have family members that are connected to different countries we have family members that we have to care for. We have parents that are up in age. All of that day-to-day -day issues and people feel, feel, I think they forget about everyday life. Thank it's you so hard. Thank you, Sovelia. I'm going to lightly move us on, and I hate to cut you off briefly. You know, thinking about just the extent of human suffering happening um, in this very moment, you know, we want to uh, lightly transition us over to the conversation right on a really proud moment for the union um, to be among the first to be able to call for a ceasefire locally. Um, so Rami and Aaron, you know, I um, want to start this conversation off with you all um, the similar way as we think about like how far back in the understanding of the human experience we need to understand this issue. Um, what is, uh, why is calling for a ceasefire in this moment important um, from your perspective? How close are we achieving that? And then I know each of you have had different experiences in terms of curriculum and how this conversation gets tied in in the classroom and um, want to invite you to invite those experiences in. So I'll kick it over to you too. Um, all right, I can start off if that's okay with Aaron. Um, yeah, so context is important, but you don't need a PhD in international relations to understand that like occupation, settler colonialism, uh, open air prisons, ethnic cleansing, like, these things are morally and ethically wrong, right? Like we don't need to um, understand fully why they're wrong. We know that they're wrong. Um, history can help us better, better understand how they came to be, but we got to make sure that it doesn't excuse um, how we've gotten here. And it's important to understand where history starts. Um, over the last couple of months, history seemingly started on October 7th, um, started long before that. Um, I know my family, I had to leave Lebanon because of a civil war in the 80s um, where my family's village was occupied by the IDF. So, and that's just my family um, specifically. This goes back to 1948 and way before, um, but this context I think oftentimes is used to make it seem more complicated than it is. Ethnic cleansing isn't complicated. We know it's wrong, right? Open air prisons are wrong. It, it's, there's nothing complicated about that. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. The Palestinian poet uh, Mori Barghouti, he wrote about the dangers of starting with secondly. And I feel like since this latest escalation of violence, we have started on thirdly, like not even secondly. We've erased, you know, 
um, 70 plus years of occupation just like that. And there's been this concerted effort um, for as long as you know I've been alive to um, paint this as a very complicated issue, right? To make it seem like it's a religious struggle, to make it seem like it's thousands of years old. It, it's anything but that, right? <laughs> like it is a, you know, a settler colonial problem that came about from European settler colonialism in the 20th century. This doesn't go back to seventh century. Like the further back you go, the easier it is to see that like Muslims and Jews and Christians have lived peacefully and coexisted together for a long time. And it wasn't until European colonialism that these things have escalated um, and led to the displacement of millions of Palestinians. And now it's the the murder of tens of thousands, including you know men, women, and children. Um, I also want to like very specifically highlight a lot of times in the discussion it comes up that um you know palestine or, or Gaza strip in particular has 50 percent of the population is under the age of i think um, 14 and like it, it's horrifying to understand that half of the casualties have been children um, but a lot of times that kind of erases the the men and the women who have been killed in this occupation as well and i think it's really important to include them in these conversations um in terms of a ceasefire, um, I don't know how many people are aware, but Cori Bush was the first congressperson to introduce this legislation. So it's since been supported by 34 other electeds. Um, and it seems like we're getting closer and closer every day. The public pressure seems to be working, but it is slow. And it's hard because there are real lives at stake here. And you know it goes slow and more and more people die and this takes its toll on everybody. Um, and like I, I don't think ceasefire is the ultimate goal, right? <laughs> ceasefire is like the band-aid for what has been happening in the last two months. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't replace or it doesn't fix what has been happening. It doesn't liberate anybody. It just literally stops the killing of innocent civilians. And I feel like that is the bare minimum that we've been asking for. And even that has been a huge struggle. Um, in Illinois, luckily, we've had you know Congress people like Delia and Shuey and Jonathan Jackson have all supported the resolution. Jen Schakowsky still has not. So if you live in her, in her district, it's really important to call her and put pressure on her daily to make sure that she you know she moves a little bit on this. Uh, Senator Dick Durbin has also supported the resolution. Um, Tammy Duckworth has not. So like keeping it local, there are actual steps that we can take to push for this resolution. Um, Within our own city council, Chicago progressive staffers have tried to push for a resolution and that vote has been postponed or canceled. And it's an attempt to, to stifle this conversation even more, even though hundreds of progressive staffers are calling for this. Um, millions of people throughout this country are calling for it. Nearly every other country in the world is calling for a ceasefire. And it wasn't until the US vetoed it yet again that it didn't go through in the United Nations. Um, and we can go on and on about this, but like, I really want to stress that the ceasefire is not the solution. The ceasefire is like a secession on murder and death. And that is not asking for a lot. That is asking for humanity and dignity and the bare, bare minimum for survival. Um, and I think we're going to come back to this conversation a little, but I want to give time for Aaron as well. Hi, Aaron Lynch, uh, she, her, I'm from Yon School of Fine Arts. Um, I think Rami put very beautifully the piece that a ceasefire is the bare minimum. It is a, it is the bare minimum starting point. Um, your question was twofold, speaking a lot about um, curriculum. And I think that's something that many of our educators fear. Um, it's something that people have faced real backlash around. Um, as a visual arts educator, I've had the opportunity to be able to um, really integrate this into my curriculum in some very natural ways. Um, there are wonderful resources out there for teachers and you know there are spaces to share this. Um, but one of, the, one of the big pieces was several years ago, um, my students were able to participate in an international art exchange with students at a UN refugee camp in Jordan. And I was nervous, I had a, a class, this is, during the time our principal was trying out homogeneous classrooms, I had a classroom of seventh grade 
um, all black boys at 43rd and King Drive. And I was nervous. They're going to be speaking to um, both boys and girls, girls in hijabs, um, and speaking to people in a refugee camp. And I thought, you know, how do I actually pair these experiences? But we did have incredibly beautiful conversation. And we made the correlation between um, collective punishment. We made the correlation between um, the targets and saying that a block per se was was owned by Hamas, the same that my students were experiencing with gang violence. We were a welcoming school. We had our students were crossing gang lines at that time. Um, and it was a very real factor, especially for my young boys. And to have those conversations, it just really clicked for them. They had these beautiful pieces to understand each other, to understand um, how people perceive you differently, that in that collective punishment and having the ideas that because someone lives on my block or the perception that someone might live on my block, that everyone there um, might be associated with that when that was very not true. Um, I've also integrated a lot with um, Banksy and his Waldorf Hotel. It brings up great conversations. I also think looking at places like crit critical media literacy is a great place. If you're a person that's nervous or scared about how to bring this into your classroom, there are um, some wonderful toolkits um, that I'm glad to share with CTU um, on. But looking at multiple articles and looking at the lens. Who was this written by? Was it written by a Palestinian journalist? Was this written by someone from the Associated Press? Who was quoted in these, um, in articles? What are the images that are used? Um, who's the audience that they're trying to showcase this for? And there's places and ways that you can have these real life conversations you know, my conversations with this um, around Banksy's Waldorf Hotel, I had Jewish students in my classroom. I had Palestinian students in my classroom. And we had real healthy discussions in that way. But I think a lot of it comes down to your facilitation. And I think because of the fear mongering that so many people are facing, the doxing that people are facing, um, it's a real life fear that many of our educators are feeling, particularly um, our Palestinian and our Arab um educators are, you know, being these targets in spaces. I met last night with a group of educators across Chicagoland um, that are focused on teaching truth and teaching Palestine. And to hear multiple Palestinian educators talk about their Arab warmth and how they're joyous and, and jolly people in their classrooms and how they are feeling this immense pain at this time. Um, and to have to face that and to bring that into their their children's lives and actually hearing our kids struggling as we heard in a similar piece with Tomas and Saveria um, about the need for social work, the need for social emotional supports. Our students are facing this. They have family that they're, they're fearing for, that they have not heard back from. And how do we address these things? Um, it's, a, it's a tough, tough place. But as Rami said, this is teaching about settler colonialism. It is teaching truth. And it's something that we do. We teach about indigenous history. We teach about other um, places of occupation as Juan was talking about in Ukraine. There is no reason why we cannot be teaching the truth about what is happening to our students. And we have so many here. Cook County has the largest population of Palestinians in the nation um, of any other county. This is our students. It is our educators. It impacts our community right now and has for um, decades. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Gonzalez. Yeah, I'd like to uh, say a couple of things about this issue. You know, democracy now, we we provide, I believe, the best coverage of any news outlet in the United States on the, uh, the war that is going on in the Middle East right now. And we specifically focus on voices from inside of Israel or inside or in the Palestinian territories itself. Because I think one of the and I and I don't envy you as teachers right now because it is a real tough time for anyone teaching uh, current events uh, and the the kind of witch hunt that is occurring across the United States and even all of Western Europe. But for instance, one of the things that we hear a lot, and and this is basically from the reporting of the Anti Defamation League, that there has been this exponential increase in anti Semitic incidents in the United States. Well. The ADL's metrics 
is any protest in support of the Palestinians is considered anti-Semitic. Uh, so uh, all of these protests, uh, for, as far as they're concerned, are anti-Semitic incidents. And that's how they juice the numbers of the enormous numbers of supposed anti-Semitic incidents that have occurred. Uh, this attempt to equate uh, uh, criticism or opposition to Israel with anti-Semitism is completely, is completely erroneous. I'm 76 years old. I am older than the state of Israel, okay? I when I was born, there was no state of Israel. Uh, and the reality is, whereas the Jewish people have existed for 5,000 years. <laughs> uh, so there's a difference between Judaism as a religion and the concept of creating a theocratic state, which is, a re as someone mentioned, is a, re a recent phenomenon. Zionism is a recent phenomenon of the late 19th and early 20th century coming out of Europe and, in fact, as someone who grew up in New York City, spent most of my life in New York City, I'm well aware that there are very relig uh, conservative Hasidic Jews who oppose the state of Israel. The Satmars are a major Hasidic sect. They have always opposed the state of Israel because they don't believe that God and state should be combined in one entity. Uh, and, uh, and so there are and uh, organizations like Jews for Peace, Beth Selim, there are all kinds of organizations. It's a huge battle within the Jewish community over the state of Israel. And yet we're being told that you, you, uh, that you can't criticize uh, or you can't have a, a, a different pos uh, perspective or position on the occupation of the Palestinian lands. So I think it's important to fight back against that basic idea that this is there's rampant anti-Semitism occurring as a result of what's happened in the last few months. No, uh, the numbers are being juiced, the history is being forgotten, uh, and uh, people are trying to conflate a religion with a colonial uh, a settler state, and they're not the same thing. And it's uh, it's hard for teachers to oppose it, but you, uh, I, you know, I definitely encourage you to do that, and uh, and also to encourage people to watch Democracy Now! because we have voices, uh, you know, People forget Albert Einstein was not in favor uh, of the state of Israel for the same reason. He didn't believe uh, that you needed to have a uh, a Jewish state uh, to uh, be able to uh, to defend and uh, promote the advancement of the Jewish people. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. And then to broadly transition this question about like what role we have as a union and then specifically thinking about what we're about to embark on as we think about our contract and forming the best possible contract, not just for our union, but for our students and for our city. I'm gonna ask you all to kind of weigh in on like what is next, right? In the context of this conversation of us fighting systems of oppression, what obligation does that mean for us in our contract? And then for Mr. Gonzalez, I think the, the light pivot, like as as a union, what you know, what do you see as our obligation within the broader later movement to continue weighing in on not these issues and beyond? Um, so maybe I'll I'll kick it over to um, Rami as my uh, first victim of this question, if it's cool, and we'll popcorn it around. For sure. Um, so I also want to talk a little bit about my school because um, I feel like my school is a little different from what everybody else has been saying. Um, I teach at Clinton Elementary. It's in the Westridge neighborhood. Um, and we are the second, I think we were the second, we're now the third largest EL school in the city, but we have over 40 languages. So in my classroom, I have 31 students. I teach first grade. I know it's outrageous. I have 31 students and I have 13 languages. So Tomas, you said sometimes there's four or five. We have more than double that in, our, in my own classroom. Um, and luckily at our school for the last eight plus years, we have had a newcomer program. Um, we have two ELPTs because of how large our EL program is. And even though we've had this program for the last eight years, there are still things that we are learning every single year, every day. Um, this year, I got my first student from Kyrgyzstan, and she's a Russian speaker, and it was my first time ever meeting somebody from Kyrgyzstan. Um, but luckily, the infrastructure that we have had in place at our school has been able to support our, our newest newcomers as well. Um, and some of those supports include trauma-informed PDs, which my first year at the school, we had that provided by Lurie Children's Hospital. Um, and also partnering with different community organizations. Um, it was formerly known as Asian Human Services, but now it's known as Trellis. Um, they've delivered some of those uh, trauma-informed PDs for us to understand, um, like Slovenia is saying, what our students and their families have gone through, because that context is important to 
to support them. So I think in our contract, we can push for um, more of these PDs and, and to make sure that every school does have a counselor and a therapist to, to be able to support our students, which if you guys remember four years ago is the same thing that we were asking for. Um, a lot of times when people talk about EL education, it's mostly bilingual and English and Spanish. Um, and that's true for a lot of the city, but that's not true for all of the city. Um, and specifically, if I'm speaking for my school, like I said, we have over 40 languages and that has a lot of very unique challenges, um, but it's incredible what we've been able to see these students do because we have been lucky enough to have these resources. We've had an admin who's been really, really conscious about this and worked to make sure that most teachers are EL certified. Um, fighting for things like um, reduction in tuition to make sure that we can be EL certified is something that I think is really important that we can push for. Um, there's there's one quick thing I wanted to mention. So uh, I think Tomas, you said that there were no Russian bilingual teachers, um, which like, you know, there should be bilingual teachers in every language. But in my school, we have a very large population of Rohingya students, and there is no written script in Rohingya. Um, so it is impossible to become a Rohingya bilingual speaker. So, you know, we, I think, really have a chance to be creative in what we're asking for and even reframing what it means to be a bilingual teacher or who is allowed into these buildings and um, able to support our students is something that we can absolutely push for. Um, let's, uh, and I don't want to take up too much time, um, but one last thing, we have been lucky enough to partner with organizations like Trellis and Refugee One, um, but even that is limited because being a refugee is a special legal designation and this, you know, the incoming migrants do not have that designation. They are asylum seekers. So they're not entitled to a lot of the benefits that come from being a refugee, which, you know, sometimes it supports you with housing, with um, a faster process for um, uh, work permits um, and even organizational uh, supports. So pushing to make sure that like, yes, we are a sanctuary city and we're gonna make sure that we are a sanctuary city for all people, not just refugees, but asylum seekers are able to, to access those, um, those benefits as well. And I don't know if you want me to pass it, Graciela, or? Yes, let's pass it, uh, go ahead. Uh, maybe we go reverse order, so I can see Aaron, do you wanna go next? Sure. Um, to add on to what Rami's stating, um, we absolutely need those supports for um, our EL students. Tonight, my uh, local school council is voting because we have gotten additional funding because of our newcomer students and our population. Um, but how that money is going to be dedicated and spent is up in the air, and that's interesting. It, it should be going directly to the population that has come into our school that needs supports. As Tomas said, we need to have reading programs for our early childhood um, educators that are in those native languages, not translated copies of something. It's wonderful that like, we happen to have a math curriculum that's not Skyline and Vision that does have videos and has text and has everything in Spanish, but we do, um, not to Rami's extent, but we do have multiple other languages as well that are spoken. But we definitely need phonics and we need other ways. Teaching reading in Spanish is different than teaching English, and we need to have those supports for our educators. That needs to be something in a contract campaign. Um, Additionally, as Rami stated before as well, looking at the fact that we have asylum seekers. You know, I have a parent sitting in our auditorium as I left school today waiting for a student to get back from a field trip and their time is ticking on that 60 days that they'll be kicked out of their shelter. And she's nervous, you know, that's going to be in February when it is bitter cold, when she fears her and her kids dying on the street. Um, they have not been providing bus cards for um, our students that are asylum seekers. Um, just even the way that the district has gone about things. And we had students staying at a church in our, com in our community and they enrolled um, the kindergarten through eighth grade students at our school, even though we had open space with a Spanish speaking um, preschool teacher, yet they enrolled those students in a totally different neighborhood where they now have to travel across you know, the city to deposit those students at school. So I think there are ways that we can address and support our communities in how they can traverse and creating these hubs where um, our students and our families can feel comfortable um, 
thank God I have a great ELTP at our school, but she's only half time. And we have a great bilingual advisory council of really phenomenal parents. And that community has made a lot of our newcomers want to stay. There's, they've stated it very clearly. If they um, get permanent housing in a different place, they're going to travel across the city to our school because they love that community. And we need to build those hubs and these communities that support our students. Um, and lastly, that social emotional piece. There is no social emotional supports for my newcomers. I have a child in um, kindergarten that spoke about, you know, their family being chased with someone from with a machete through the jungle as they came from Colombia. Um, I've had another student make a whole illustration about his real, his grandest fear is having to cross another river again. And these are students that need support, yet they're not getting it because they don't have Spanish speaking social workers or counselors. So why are we not triaging students in these neighborhoods? Sylvia has talked about it in her community. It's happening with all of her students, but we have um, a population that is being left out of these supports. And if we address those, we are in a better position to be able to even begin educating students. If we're not meeting the basic needs of food, housing, and shelter, our students and our, their families struggle to be able to, um, to function. So that's something that I think is a huge, huge piece in making these pathways for our asylum seekers to have permanent housing, to have ways to get jobs. That parent that is sitting in our auditorium is desperate for a job. They are people that want to work. They want to create a better life. They want to contribute to this multicultural land um, that was founded um, by migrants. <laughs> founded, if we're gonna talk about the settler colonial piece, but the people who are here and the powers that be are the people who, whose families came here as migrants as well. Thank you, Erin. And thinking about just continuing to advance that conversation, Tavelia, like thinking about like your effort and fight to try to ensure that your the practice at your school centers all of your babies, right? Like pre-existing newcomers just doesn't matter the designation. What does that look like in the contract for you? Ooh. Um, <clears throat> having, I think for me, a lot of what has already been said, the SEL is a big piece um, for me um, because we can't teach to the mind when their souls are not whole when students are coming in, don't know where they're gonna lay their head, where they're gonna get their next meal, what my mom is going through, don't know when about their family members or anything like that. Um, what we're trying to present to them academically is not going to, is not gonna stick. Um, because that's not, they're in survival mode. They're not thinking, I need this. I'm not thinking about being a lifelong learner at that particular time and why I need my education on this particular day. I'm thinking about surviving. Um, and until we address all of we have to we have to meet the needs of our students. We have to make sure that we look at the whole child and the whole family. We we have to. We have to look at everybody um, as a whole. We cannot just look at parts. And I feel like that's what CPS has done for decades is just look at pieces. Let's do this piece. Let's do this piece. Let's do this piece. And they have not, they've never taken the opportunity to put together a whole system. So I would like to see something that is presented where we're going to service the whole family and our staff, our CPS students, our teachers, we take in a lot of what our students carry every day. 
And often I think about how do we get rid of that and deal with our own things every day. Um, and sometimes we need we need self-care as well. And we need to be able to have those different things. But in our contract, I feel like we it needs to be our um CPS needs to be, do a whole lot of revamping. We cannot go back to pre-pandemic. And CPS wants us to teach pre-pandemic and it's not working. And they have not under they don't understand that what used to work before the pandemic, it does not work anymore. And as a union, we have to get them to understand this is what, what we did before 2020 is not going to help our, it's not helping our students now. So they have to listen to the experts because, and the teachers and the principals are the experts of what's going on because every building is different. Skyline is not for every building. You want to give us a curriculum that is supposed to be for every building and every building does not look the same. Nobody's building is the same. Nobody's building is made up of the same demographics. But you want us to use something that, first of all, is not put together well. It doesn't meet the needs and it doesn't have, as we say, windows and mirrors where it's culturally relevant to the people that we are teaching throughout the city of Chicago. Thank you, Sovelia. And lightly, uh, Tomas, before I kick it over to Mr. Gonzalez for his recommendations. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> you asked about our union being dedicated to common good agenda tr that transformed our city. And I think that this work is important because these issues connect to our classrooms, they connect to our schools. Um, and I think it is our responsibility as educators to advocate and uplift causes that impact our students and fight for resources that will facilitate their school experiences. And many times that expands beyond the classroom and we need to be on the front line fighting for those um, resources. And to kind of to go back a little bit to when I mentioned <clears throat> that when people ask me, oh, why is the teachers union focused on something that in this case, for example, we're talking about the refugees um, and something that's an immigration issue, it's a political issue. And I think back, for example, to like reading articles in the media or community uh, meetings that I've, or town hall meetings I've attended in a couple of wards here in the city and how migrants are being vilified, refugees are being vilified and we're really dehumanizing them. And when I walk into my classroom, I see humans, I see, I see young children. I teach, I'm a preschool teacher. I see very young children and I teach them to respect one another. We teach them to reach their full potential. And this is difficult to do. It's difficult for them to reach their full potential if we don't have adequate resources. And I'm not just talking about addressing, kind of like Tovey was saying, just addressing the academic well-being of our students. We need to address, and Aaron also mentioned this, it was, it's been mentioned tonight, um, their social emotional well-being as well. That means our students need uh, travel support, ESL, safe housing, meals. And I think we need to ensure that we're providing our students with a safe and welcoming city and also a safe and welcoming school environment. And that's why I think it's important that we focus on these issues because these issues, while they're citywide issues, nationwide as well, they directly impact um, our students in the classroom and, and teachers as well as we've heard tonight. And that's why I think that it's really important for our union to continue this type of work. Thank you. And lastly, to kick it off to you, Mr. Gonzalez, I know you when, when yeah. you were with us, we had a conversation about policy suggestions, our role in, in facilitating Black Brown conversation. Just curious what recommendations you'd have for us to ponder. Yeah, I, I would. Uh, I want to 
reinforce what several people have said about the importance of mental health services and trauma services for the young people. My brother-in-law is a uh, is a teacher's aide in a Chicago public school, and and um, he's uh, Mexican American, and he told me he's told me some of the stories of the children he's had to deal with. Uh, uh, a, a child who came through the Darien Gap up from South America, and who he says it's very hard to get him to talk at all, to, to communicate with other people, because the trauma he has gone through, no one has been able to address it or try, somehow or other get to him. And then he tells me about another uh, a Mexican child who he says is brilliant. He says the kid tells, tells him all the time, look, I'm bored. This stuff, I learned this years ago uh, when I was in school in Mexico. And the only thing is the kid can't speak English, so he's a brilliant kid, but he's completely bored with school, and no one understands that because just because there's a the, the language barrier. So I think that um, you know, when I was growing up in New York City in the 1950s, I I was born in Puerto Rico, but uh, and I entered public school, but I came as a baby, so I entered public school in kindergarten speaking only Spanish. But since I was able to dominate English very quickly, uh, throughout my entire public school career. Whenever a kid from Puerto Rico came into the schools in New York City, there were a lot of them coming in in the 50s and 60s, the teacher would always put the, uh, the child next to me. And uh, she would say to me, you translate for him my lessons. So I became like an unpaid uh, bilingual program for the public schools. Throughout my entire career, I always had kids assigned to me to help them maneuver through the system. It seems to me that the public school system should try to figure out a way to utilize the students themselves, those children who have managed to adapt more quickly, because that helped train me in not only listening to the teacher, but then at the same time trying to explain to someone next to me what was happening. Uh, you could use not only the students, but the parents themselves in some capacity to assist the transition process uh, for uh, those who are having more trouble. Uh, and I, I think that that you might have some success. And and also that empowers the students themselves because they feel they can contribute uh, to uh, to um, to their fellow classmates. Uh, so, I, you know, I would definitely urge more press for more mental health uh, services, especially in this critical time where so many people are coming in with trauma uh, that they need addressed uh, and. Um, trying to figure out some way to get the parents, because here's another little fact that most people are not aware of. The Venezuelans who have come into the United States in the last four or five years are the most educated migrants in history of the United States. Uh, 61% of all Venezuelan adults who have come into the country over the last five years have a bachelor's degree or higher, a bachelor's degree or higher. The For the the total U.S. population, only 34 percent of all Americans who are adults have a bachelor's degree or higher. Uh, and immigrants, other immigrants are less. So these are educated Venezuelans. I'm not talking about the Mexicans, Honduras, uh, Guatemalans, uh, the different. As somebody said, every nationality has a different uh, uh, history. But the Venezuelans who have come are largely professional middle class people. Uh, and so they have skills. The only thing they don't know is the language and they don't have the networks. So it's possible to utilize assistance from the very community that needs help to try to help maneuver through this crisis for the city. And I think that um, there's great opportunity there. Uh, and it's it's not all bleak, but I definitely have to salute all of you because you're on the front lines. You deal with it every day. Uh, and I know it's a tough situation for you. And I, I want to salute you for all the efforts that you keep making and keep struggling to to make the, the public schools better. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez, for that um, uplifted. Um, I think on behalf of our union and our membership, just thank you so much for sharing time and space with us and your reflections. Um, and also seeing um, our teaching community as that um, powerful uh, folks that are not just on the front lines, but are also incredible movement agents wherever they teach and live and breathe. So thank you. Um, with that, um, I want to kick it over just to a couple of observations that we have from the question and answer and also invite folks. I think we have time for like maybe one or two questions if folks want 
want to drop anything in the chat, um, but just thinking about some of the suggestions and observations folks have made um, for additional support, given our conversation around sanctuary and our newcoming students, um, that um, there's a suggestion to have a list of key supports and services that LSCs can place on meeting agendas to request for their schools. So could let some best practice collecting um, as a suggestion. And then if I lifts up, sorry, I was just at my school's LSC meeting and was able to get the LSC to use additional funds for our ELs. We'll be working with the budget committee to identify specifics on how to spend the funds. So thinking about literally emerging practice that's happening in our schools, thinking about how we change funding, which is awesome. Um, and uh, making another invitation in case folks have questions before we start wrapping up our conversation for this panel. Okay, well, seeing the, the lovely conversation that was had, I really want to thank our panelists, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, Rami, Tomas, Aaron, um, and Silvelia for taking time to help us make connections across just a wide breadth of issues. These are really difficult and trying times, but it's incredible to be a part of a broader labor movement that understands our civic obligation to lean into this, to center the human suffering and systems of oppression that are occurring and think about um, this with the role of a tactician, how can we can use our contract to leverage a common good agenda that not only transforms our city, but stands in solidarity with global movements that are happening around us. Um, so we'll be sending some um, next steps in terms of folks. There's some pre-questions that have happened for many people in terms of what else can we be doing to support our students. And so um, Linda um, Perales in our organizing department um, had pre-assembled a couple of things that we'll share out as next steps. We'd also happily encourage folks, right, our many of our committees, committees are hard at work in terms of making sure that provisions are being explored for our contract. So a plug, if folks um, haven't been on a committee or have ideas, um, we'll also share out next steps in terms of how to get involved in the process. And then lastly, there'll be a part three to the Sanctuary series um, coming soon, so we'll also make sure that folks hear about that. So just checking our chat to see if there's any final questions before I let folks go. And beautiful. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to our panelists, and I hope you all have a good rest of your evening. Thank you.